This is that one audition with Alicia Oxy. The love hate process with auditioning. Really? You? Yeah. Still. Yeah. After even after twenty some like, years. Yeah. Even being a performer, being on stage as a musician, then going to stage, then hitting up television. Is the actual audition process? Walk us. I'm, I'm so curious. Like the love hate part of it. What's the parts that you love, and what's what's the part that you? Hate? <laughs> I think the thing I that I love the most about it is that it does really it it does feel really big. You know, like you can be having a, a rather mundane day, but then at two o'clock, you know, you're expected to be somewhere uh, with with something to prove. You know, something to kind of reach for and swing for. And it usually lasts, you know, 15 to 20 minutes and that's it. But everything else kind of falls and fades away when you're in the room. I mean, I don't even know if anyone's in rooms anymore. I know everything is very much online now. It's a lot of self-tapes and a lot of Zoom auditions. Uh, I've maybe been into into a room for an audition like a a handful of times in the last couple of years, which I think was obviously only uh, further affected by, by the pandemic. Um, but I, I like the kind of showtime feeling of having to go and, you know, you feel like you're laying it all on the line and it all comes down to this moment and it's a make it or break it. Um, uh, it's not really as big as all that, but you know, I yeah. think your body doesn't know the difference. So it feels like this big, this, this big high stakes event to kind of go and audition for something. And, and I, I like that element of it. Um, but I, t- to be totally honest with you, just like, I'm 38 now. And, you know, I started auditioning as an actor when I was 13, 14. Um, and so I've been doing it for a long, long time. And to just be like so blunt about it, I'm frustrated sometimes that I, I still have to do it, totally. <laughs> you know, because yeah. I and I'm not like um, uh, I've achieved a lot and I'm very proud of it. But but I'm not really in like the offer only kind of category like if I wanted to be like a straight up offer only actor, it would mean it, it means um, saying like goodbye to a lot of work because it's still an incredibly competitive um, uh, art form and industry. And it's only getting, I think, more and more competitive as it as it grows and changes and evolves. And the more young people, I think, because of the advent of the Internet, it, it feels more accessible yeah. Um, then maybe it did 20 some years ago when, you know, I got into acting as a young teen. Um, I didn't even have a computer, you know, there was, we didn't have the internet. So it was all just, uh, was that dial fandom. up if we were lucky, right? It was exactly. like getting out of the newspaper running around. So I'm so curious. So both your parents were musicians mm-hmm. it felt like you kind of started in music. So was the auditions at 13, 14, was that just, well, I'll just try something else. Cause music wasn't the, I, I was so curious when I was doing the research, Yeah, what love came first and then how you kind of fell into working as an actor or if they kind of coincided together for you. Yeah, they kind of coincided. I, I think the idea of the, you know, of the performing arts was just something I was introduced to really young. My, my parents play music uh, as a, you know, kind of semi-pro hobby and every weekend, we my, they were taking me and my sisters to a folk festival or some kind of arts and crafts fair where they'd be performing. And so I got to see a lot of really amazing singer songwriters and musicians from an early age. Um, and then my family got involved in community theater. Um, and my sisters and my mom were were performing in the kind of local children's theater and the community theater in Wilmington, Delaware, where I grew up. Um, and I was watching them perform, and I also had like. A, an a immediate obsession with film, you know, it's just one of those kids in the late eighties, early nineties, where that, that was the entertainment. Um, we had basic, we never got cable in my house. We only had basic cable. And so it was a lot of trips to the video store to, to rent movies. And right around the same time that I was getting obsessed with film and, and being introduced to like a lot of books and literature and pop culture, I think my my parents saw that I, I I was a bit of a ham and you know I wanted to perform I I wanted that kind of attention I mean I, I still to this day have that real introvert extrovert thing um, where I, I wanted to go for it but I also have been, you know kind of been marred by stage fright and the likes uh, through, throughout my years but my parents encouraged me to audition for local community theater and I started doing that and and. Um, and uh, I, the, the kind of big turning point was when I was about 12, I think I was 12 years old, 
I went to an open casting call in Philadelphia, which is the closest big metropolis um, to where I grew up. And they were looking for somebody to play uh, a young Ethan Hawke in the 1998 or 99 remake of Great Expectations uh, that Ethan Hawke did with Robert De Niro and Gwyneth Paltrow. And for the young sequences, they were looking for somebody to, to play him. And, you know, I think my, I think my dad knew someone who was one of the casting directors in Philly and, and uh, we, we thought, well, why don't we go up to Philly and, and give it a whirl? And, um, and I ended up uh, getting a couple of callbacks. I didn't get it. Um, it was like one of those kind of countrywide casting calls. I think they went to every major city to see if they could find somebody that looked like a, you know, 13, 14 year old Ethan Hawke. And I didn't get it. But the fact that I got uh, through a couple of the you know, uh, the, the goalposts there, I think my, my parents were like, wow, I mean, maybe, maybe he's, I think he's pretty good at this. And then I started doing community theater and, um, and that was really my, where I, uh, you know, I mean, for lack of better terminology, where I caught the bug and I started actually getting up on stage and performing. And it was, you know, there was before and after, uh, you know, in my life, it was right. before performing and then after. And I, I was 12 when I did my first community theater play, uh, in Wilmington, Delaware, which was the, a production, an adaptation of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And I was the kid that gets killed by Frankenstein's creation on stage. And um, I was just hooked, you know, the first night being up in front of the lights. I was just like, oh, I want to, I want to do this for the rest of my life. Which, okay. So then is, is theater, musical theater then become like the goal? Because then you, you get to New York and you're starting to, you pop off in Broadway. And as a person who wants to be seen but not seen mm -hmm. how is that audition process like what lands you into finally really stepping foot into broadway and getting that yeah um i it's funny i the i loved musicals growing up and i was obsessed with um like every i think theater fan of my generation uh, you know, I got the Rent soundtrack for uh, for Christmas one year. I hadn't seen it on stage, but my parents knew like, oh, this is the cool young people musical. <laughs> uh, and I listened to that and I was just blown away. And my mom showed me the the original West Side Story film on VHS when I was a kid. And uh, the, the, the film version of Camelot was on heavy rotation in my house growing up. So I loved musicals. But when I when I started auditioning in my teens, I learned pretty quickly uh, that I, I didn't really have like a big showy voice. I didn't have the Broadway pipes and they took a couple of voice lessons, but it just didn't really come natural to me. So I had shied away from musical theater auditions altogether. I'd kind of pass on them and turn them down. Um, no way. Because I went in a couple times for some and I just was, my, my voice would crack or I'd be in the, I'd be in the waiting room listening to guys go in before me who, who really are genuinely like gifted and phenomenal you know, A plus musical theater singers with that voice. And so I didn't really want to be seen for that stuff. I always wanted to do straight plays or film and television. And I got really lucky when I was, when I was 14 years old, I went, um, I went up to Philadelphia and I met with a manager that had been recommended to my, my family. Uh, she had an office in Philly and an office in New York. And she was my, she remained my manager for, for 20 years from, from 13 to my early thirties. And uh, she started sending me to New York on auditions. And I did this one audition for a, for a play that I ended up getting. And it was my stage debut in New York city when I was 15 off Broadway at the Manhattan theater club. And that audition was, you know, if, if, if you really, if I really think of like one that, that really changed my life that, and here we are on that one audition, that one audition podcast. Yeah. It probably was for this play because I, I got cast in this play called Current Events by David Marshall Grant. And um, I was, you know, suddenly found myself living in New York City with my mom in an apartment on the Upper West Side and going and doing this play every night. And for a, for a teenager at the time, there was there really weren't any meaty stage roles, but I, I got lucky and I found this one. And um, a, uh, a playwright named David Lindsay Bear became familiar with my work at that time. And from 16 to 21, he, he cast me in two more of his, in three of his plays. Um, and that really kind of was, was a totally life-changing experience was that I, I, be, I became sort of a, a young <laughs> muse, if you will, to this Absolutely. really gifted playwright uh, yeah. who, who kept bringing me back. 
And that was what made me move to New York. And right around the same time as when I found my agent for the first time. And eventually that's what led me uh, to auditioning for Spring Awakening, which was my first Broadway musical. Well, that's what I, even, I, I always wish that people could see my face sometimes because when I do the research and I know the building blocks or I see what I'm putting together and then you hear it from somebody, when you can see it's so designed, right? When you can go backwards and look at this, you have no idea what that, one audition is going to lead to. Mm -hmm. And also from, for somebody who's going through, you know, the awkward stages, let's say, like, I love that. You're like, I don't want to do musicals, your voice, all of this mm. to then land almost 10 years later on stage in a musical play and then get the Tony for it. Right. Like, yeah. on, You can't write a better script for that, but telling your 14 or 12 year old self, Hey man, just, uh, just keep going. You have no idea where this is going to circle back to with your music totally. and stuff. I love this. And then, so here's my question, mm -hmm. which how great to be brought up in music, uh, in theater, how great to be brought up in musical theater, oh, yeah. the audition process, you know, for theater, so much different than television and film. You get to, you get awarded this role. You get this time to rehearse and discover the character. You're all figuring it out together it's a long process, you, you know, to get to opening night. Whereas now we're, let's switch over to television and film. Mm -hmm. You get an audition, you have 24 hours to present your best foot forward. There's no collaboration, or at least it doesn't feel that way. Um, and West Wing is kind of one of your first television projects. Yeah. So do you feel like plays almost helped you with the dialogue for Sorkin or did you even kind of know at that, you know, that was like what, 2001, 2002 when you shot it? Yeah. Yeah. I definitely think, um, you know, th that doing, doing theater, I do think it really did prepare me um, for Sorkin. And I think there's a reason why Aaron, uh, he really does tend to favor a lot of theater actors, you know, like kind of historically, I mean, he's started as a playwright um, before he transitioned into screenwriting and 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 television, uh, and I think he always comes back to it. Um, and uh, it is a muscle. I mean, I think some actors uh, that that favor film and TV, um, you don't, you're, you're not ever, you know, um, it's not usually asked of you to to memorize the whole script. Um, you know, which obviously, of course, when you're doing theater, that's that's the name of the game. That's what you have to do, and so. I think just the fact that I'd been doing that for a couple of years put me in the right kind of headspace and and had stretched that muscle enough that when it came to Sorkin's writing, which is extremely verbose and very, um, you know, very much like a play, um, uh, I, I felt ready for it at that time. But when I got cast in that episode of The West Wing, um, I was still living at home in Delaware. I had never seen the show. I think I was about 18 and it was it was a one of those auditions where you know for most of my teenage years up until I moved to New York City about a half a year later when I was almost nineteen years old um, for every audition I had uh, I would drive from Wilmington Delaware to Trenton New Jersey I would get on the New Jersey transit train in Trenton New Jersey ride that train into Manhattan. Um, I would do sometimes one audition. I'd be in the city for maybe 45 minutes to an hour, two hours tops, go back to Penn Station, get back on the train, back to Trenton, get back in the car and drive back home to Wilmington, Delaware. So um, my my days would be entirely consumed just to get to one audition. And I mean, bless my parents that, that they uh, uh, supported that. And I mean, they were right there with me in the car because... I, I was doing a lot of these auditions before I even had a license. So um, it's funny when I think of it now that we're able to, that I'm able to log on to a Zoom or send in a self tape over the internet because back then in the late 90s, when I first started auditioning, it was an all day process just to get to the audition. And that West Wing was one of those where I came into the city uh, very briefly. I went into a room with the casting director. I read the scene once or twice, went home, forgot about it. And a couple of weeks later, I got a call from my manager saying, hey, you got that part on the West Wing. They, they need you to go to Pittsburgh for a couple of weeks at the end of the summer. Um, and I knew it was a big deal and it was a big show, but I didn't realize how big. And, um, you know, now several decades later, uh, you know, 
every couple of years they do like, you know, like the, the great Sorkin episodes countdown. And the episode that I was on, I think it's called 20, 24 hours in America or 20 hours in America. Yep. It always ends up being in like the top 10. Um, and then like a young Amy Adams is on that episode as well, yeah. which I also, <laughs> it's I mean, like both amazing. Your guys' hairstyles were great. I was like, maybe <laughs> they got it just for the hair. You know, it, oh. you never know. It's so it's so character. I don't know That's what I was cool. going for with that haircut. I, love and I think it. I wanted to look like a, you know, Jim Morrison or something. In, in it's my late very teams. much. I mean, we were talking about Adam earlier. It's so dazed and confused. It's perfect. It's very a, much like, so. You could be so cast there. Absolutely. Um, so I just to complete that circle. Mm -hmm. Newsroom. I have to ask. Yeah. Was there any correlation of Aaron being like, oh, he's worked for me before? Let's throw this. I need to hear the whole audition for the newsroom because totally. Um, he did not know that I was the same person that uh, uh, ten years prior had been on that episode. Um, when we filmed that episode of The West Wing, he was he had to stay back in LA because he was still writing the rest of the season, and we were all on location in in Pittsburgh. So I never met him in person when I was on that episode of West Wing. He was always a voice on. Uh, on, on the mobile phone uh, as the actors and Tommy Shlami, the director, were gathering around with him on speaker to have him kind of give notes or or help direct the scene. So he was always a disembodied voice on the phone to me. And, um, you know, cut to about a, a decade later, I had done Spring Awakening on Broadway. I had done uh, Green Day's American Idiot on Broadway, um, which was a second collaboration with Michael Mayer, um, who directed Spring Awakening. And I was appearing on Broadway in a Jez Butterworth play called Jerusalem, starring Mark Rylance. And um, uh, I saw, this was one of those times where I actually, I, I'm, I'm not very good at this. Uh, I'm not, I still struggle with being like proactive in, in the business and trying to like chase things down. I, I struggle with that. I tend to kind of be like, well, if it's meant to be, it'll come my way. And if not, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it alone, you know? But I, I had happened to see a press release online and it was like you know Aaron Sorkin prepping um new pilot for HBO uh Jeff Daniels Emily Mortimer and Allison Pill joined the cast and I was like whoa those are three tremendous actors and I'd, I'd worked with Allison in the past and uh I just thought I wonder if there's any part in this for me and I, I emailed my agent and I said hey have you heard of the Aaron Sorkin pilot for HBO I I, I just wonder if there's like a part in there for me and my agent wrote back and was like, "Yeah, we'll we'll look into it right away. Uh, you're, you, we we didn't we didn't go after it for you because you're busy with this play." And I said, "Well, let's just see if we can maybe I don't know maybe we'll be able to make it work down the down the stretch." And they wrote back and said, "You know, sure enough, there's this producer role. This guy Jim Harper. He's kind of like a, a, one of the main characters of this of the show." And I read the pilot and I was like, "Oh, this is fantastic! It was one of those scripts. You know, there's only really only a handful." In in the twenty plus years I've been doing this, I maybe can remember like you know ten out of all of maybe the hundreds and some. There's really, as you know, there's just some that you read where you, it stops you in your tracks, mm -hmm. and you're like, oh, this is a real, this is the real deal. This is like a real writer. And of course, reading you know a pilot that Aaron Sorkin had written fresh off of his Oscar for The Social Network, right. it was just so clear it was going to be exciting, and it was his first time working on cable, and Greg Matola was going to direct it. So I went in and everything. yeah, it, everything. it was that so monologue many... from like the monologue is already in the pilot. I'm sure. Oh, like, yeah, it was there. about it is so tight and delicious. You get these voices already in your head. Yeah, it was. Yeah. So epic. And, and I, I would also think everybody's gunning for this part. So, yeah, I, that's I, why I, I thought you would maybe have a shoe in because at least you had West Wing in your back pocket. Or at least there was <laughs> some experience. I know. And I think I was maybe banking on that, too. I was like, yeah, maybe Aaron will remember me from uh, <laughs> From 10 Please years ago, on the short list of like, possibly it's OK. And I, I don't take it personally, but he did not know that it was the same, uh, the same person. I cut my hair and looked a lot different, um, you know, 18 to 27. I, I guess I, yeah, I, I had changed a little bit, um, but he was familiar with my work as a stage actor, which is mostly what I did in, in my 20s. I didn't really I mean, I did film and TV, but. The newsroom was the game changer. Um, I really wasn't, you know, I didn't have any kind of real strong foothold in the film and TV world until that. 
Um, That's what I was wondering with the Tony. I feel like that keeps you on Broadway. Everybody in that world knows you, but I didn't know if the Tony also opened opportunities you for you in television and film or if you were even looking that way because yeah. you were going from play to play to play when do you have time even like your agents just said didn't know if you would have time to do this yeah I was always signing on to these like eight month nine month theater runs of new musicals and and so I would be out of the running for things um and the funny thing about when I won the Tony in 2007 um I just look at how much the landscape has changed and uh, now, now I think because of the internet and because certain things like, well, Hamilton, for example, have, have really just, you know, it's, you know, the glass ceiling exploded and it was like, oh, the reach of a musical on Broadway, it can go it, at the speed of light now in a way where when I was doing Spring Awakening, it was like, I think we had MySpace was, you know, it was about, it was about it. There was no Instagram or Twitter ways for these things to go super duper viral. Um, and so when I won the Tony, I, I, it didn't, people kept telling, I kept thinking like, well, I guess I'll have my pilot after I win my Tony award. And, right. um, and that wasn't the case. I mean, the, the thing that I followed Spring Awakening with was I went back to doing off Broadway. So I actually took a step back, you know, technically, if you're looking at it, I mean, I don't see it that way, but, but um yeah, I kept thinking like, I'll, I'll go to, I'll, I'll do film and TV for my Tony win. And that just wasn't available to me at the time. Now I think if an actor, you know, if a young actor wins like an award theatrically, it does. I think Hollywood pays a little bit more attention now than they did circa 2007. Um, mm. So I kind of spent the next five or six years after winning the Tony Award still just doing plays and, and, and theater. Um, and that was around the time that I got asked to come in for uh, for the newsroom and and it took a couple of auditions and then I had to screen test and, you know, I was up against like seven or eight finalists. I think, you know, they, they brought in a lot of really great talented actors uh, for that part. Um, and just, yeah, just one of those, one of those moments where I ended up kind of being uh, How did you snag what they were it? looking for. How'd you snag it? Because I, I can like... only imagine sitting in that waiting room, especially for a Sorkin show right after the social network. Not that I'm going to make you say names, but if there were names sitting around where you're like, well, of course they're going to, he's going to get it. He's going to get oh, it. Yeah. Does that help you go well, like, well, fuck it. I'm just going to pay attention to the work. Yeah. I think that I, I had been kind of a, for a few years prior to the newsroom, I had been, I think I had my, uh, my audition uh, kind of like ethic had started to falter a little bit. Um, there was even a period, I was like 2000 and I want to say it was like 2009 where a casting director, and I won't say who, cause you know, I don't, I don't want anyone to think that I'm bad mouthing them, but casting director that had put me in several things through the years and still to this day is very, very kind to me and always calls me in for things. Um, after like a, a string of things that I didn't get, uh, for like film and TV roles, um, they had reached out to my uh, to my agent and just said, "Hey, we just want to let you know, like the last couple times John has come in, like he's been not off book. He's kind of down in his sides a lot, and it it just feels like he kind of is a, a, a little checked out, you know." And um, it was a big wake up call, and I needed it. I was in like my mid twenties at the time, and I think I was starting to, I don't want to say rest on my laurels because there weren't that many laurels to rest on, but I felt in a weird way, like I should be getting more offers at this point. And why am I going in for things? I just want a Tony and don't they know who I am? And you know, this ego driven nonsense. And it was a real big wake up call where I was like, right, what, what the hell are you doing, dude? Like, if, like, if you want to get stuff, go in acting like you want to be there and, and go show up for this. And you're not going to do good work that way. Um, it was right around that time too, that I heard somebody say, I heard a friend of mine say that you have to think of auditioning as like, um, you know, this might, what if this is the one, the one chance that you get to work on this material and, and so enjoy it because this might be as far as you go. So make the most of it, do the work, pretend like it is your opening night and then go in and and actually take a swing and make some choices. And right around that time, I do think I had started, I, I was kind of lazy uh, prior to right around that time. And um, 
And of course, because it was Sorkin and because it was such a mouthful and because I knew that everybody uh, in their right mind, it, it, you know, that and the normal actors that I would see in a waiting room and knew everybody would be vying for this part. I definitely worked, um, you know, above and beyond obsessively that week on it and, you know, wanted to make sure that I really had it dialed in. Um, but I think when I went in for my screen test, um, the thing that I got really lucky on was that they had brought in Emily Mortimer and Allison Till, who had already been cast yeah. at, to read with the people that were coming in for Jim Harper. Um, and I, I, I mean, I would like to take some credit for it, but mostly I just think I got lucky in that, like, we just really hit it off. I mean, Allison was a dear old friend. We had played brother and sister in a movie when I was a teenager. And, and so I felt immediately at home. Um, and I remember <laughs> I was totally off book. And um, because Allison, you know, had just, I think, had maybe got, they told her maybe that morning, like, hey, can you come in and read with the Jim Harpers? You know, she was reading from paper sides. Um, and uh, we were doing a scene together. Um, it was a scene that wasn't even, it wasn't in the pilot. It had been, Aaron had written it just for the auditions. Um, and it was a really funny scene that he actually ended up putting into a later episode. But I went up. Like I lost my place in the scene and I went up on my lines and I remember like um, seeing white kind of deer in the headlights moment of like, okay, Greg Matola is sitting there, Aaron Sorkin sitting there, the HBO people are, are watching and I'm, I'm blowing it. Oh my God. I don't know what my next line is. Um, and I remember it, it all happened very slow motion where I was like, you could ask for lines. You could ask to see some pages. You could start improvising, which I don't think is going to go very well. <laughs> um, and then I just remembered, oh, Allison has, uh, has, has her, has her sides. And I, I had been standing up and pacing or something. I was doing something for, you know, in the scene. And I just went over and I sat down next to Allison really quickly. And I leaned back and I just very blatantly looked over at her sides, saw my next line, got the next line. And it was right back into the scene and kind of kept going and we made it. And it was, I, I definitely broke a broke a sweat in that moment, but I remember getting to the end of that scene and thinking, okay, that 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 might have been that that might have been the moment you kind of clinched it. Um, I just felt like I I kind of I was under a lot of pressure in that moment, and I didn't uh, fall apart, which was my instinct. Um, but uh, yeah, a lot of exactly. it is you know luck and timing and who you're working with and your moment. Uh, in, well, in the, all the roads in the coming together I think that that I think with the auditions too you know we lean in when the actor drops their line right mm -hmm. we, like there's that moment and you being able to even the character your character right he is so high stressed he has so much on his plate <laughs> yeah. to like sit down and command the room and take it and pick it back up I'm sure that probably did get you the part as well as all those synchronicities coming together of having just that relationship with Alice. And that's why I think this isn't a job. This is a career. So mm -hmm. you never know where one thing can get placed in the other. I, I will, I have to ask everybody this, but particularly because you had that transitional moment mm -hmm. of the feedback of like, does he really care? Is he really invested in this? When you're literally doing plays for eight or nine months out of the year, it's like, well, no, maybe I'm just tired. I have, I have all this other things in my head that I have to do, but having that moment of them wanting you to possibly step it up in the audition room mm -hmm. at that moment, how did you approach the audition for the newsroom or any of them for that matter that changed because you've got this great background in theater other than yeah. reading the script, like what are some tangible things that help you get in? So we could use newsroom if you wanted to, because Sorkin is sometimes it's like Shakespeare. I mean, you really do have to hit all of it. So I didn't know how you approached that audition. I'll use yeah, that. no, I, I think that um, it was coming pretty hot off the heels of that that feedback. Um, and I think one thing that I had done a little bit in my 20s was um, I, 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 would, I kept missing out on, I kept not getting a lot of things because I lived in New York or, you know, wasn't in LA or didn't have enough film and TV credits. And I felt like I was a little bit on the hamster wheel of just like, I know I'm never going to get this. And, and I, I still have moments like that, to be honest, you know, 
where I'll get something from my agent and I'll be like, you guys, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll make the tape for you. I'm never going to get this. And I can even tell you who will, it's going to be <laughs> one of these five guys. So this is pointless. Um, <laughs> you know, and yep. Yep. I will, it is a, it is a grind to have to kind of like face that down and be like, but whatever, I will still go uh, work on this and try to bring my A game. It, it can be kind of, you know, it can be kind of sad and painful. I'm sorry, if I'm getting distracted, there is a squirrel. There literally is, like is a squirrel, like squirrel. Trying, <laughs> he's like trying, he keeps jumping into my window uh, in front of me and now he's climbing uh, on the window screen. I don't know if he wants to get in here and maybe he has some audition. Uh, he has some uh, tales to tell. <laughs> some, some to, <laughs> he wants to critique my auditioning style as well. Perhaps he's rabid. I don't know. But if I look distracted at all, um, I'll try to stick with it here because I feel like we were getting into something good. What I think I was saying was that it can be really, I think that what I was doing, I look back on it now with a little bit of grace for myself because I think the kind of like, I wasn't trying to self-sabotage by, by kind of going in and not working on things. I think that I just was like, I didn't want to care too much about it because I didn't want to be hurt by not getting things because it had been such a string of rejections that I think somewhere in there, there was this self-defense mechanism was like, well, if you don't care too much about it, then it won't matter when you don't get the part. But that can look like, you know, an actor who just doesn't care. Yeah. And um, and I think that's what it was starting to look like to this casting director that had been seeing me audition for, you know, almost a decade and then gave that note to my agent. And so I started realizing like, yeah, man, OK, it's going to hurt if you don't get it. Um, but you still have to go in and try because it, it, you're not going to do anybody any favors, least of all yourself, if you go in not caring, because you know what, there's a lot of people that do really care and will go in and work really, really hard. And, and it was a real, um, yeah, it was a real learning lesson, a real moment of like, yeah, who, who do I think I am? Like, I need to really check myself here. And all I, all you have is that one moment and the material and y- you know, you never know how close you're going to get on it. You don't know if you're right for it or not, but you still, uh, you got to really just try to just go in there and care about it and and bring it. And so that was, I think what I started doing around that year, kind of circa 2010, 2011, I would get these auditions and I would treat it not, not like I had the job already, but I would really spend several, like if I got the material, I'd immediately start memorizing and prepping it and being like, well, we'll treat this thing with some, some reverence and some respect. And, and and when you know when you get something as good as an audition for Sorkin material as an actor, you, you want to take it seriously, you know, because it isn't just like a procedural or a couple of lines, you know, in a, in a, in a in one scene of a film or something. So it gives you the opportunity to really sink your teeth into it. Completely, and I also think also get ruffled. So I didn't know with your amazing theater background, with having so much time to work with within characters if you have a shorthand now when you get an audition like that I mean some people even do memorization skills because when you're moving at a pace like Sorkin you can't drop anything so are you focusing more on relationship to build um, your momentum with the character or were you looking more at even viewpoints like how Mm. how did you let yourself kind of really sink into this material to be able to turn around and deliver, even if it's four or five days later, hopefully they gave you some time with Sorkin. Yeah. Thankfully there was their idea. I had, I think of like a four or five day prep, maybe I think for that one. And, you know, I I think what you learn doing theater and what, one of the things that I love so much about theater is that, you know, the idea is to, you know, know it so well and know it inside and out that um, you can free up all the space in your brain. Um, to to focus more on being present being in the moment reacting to your scene partner listening to them trying to make it all feel like the first time which you know to me really you know can only really happen if you really know the material inside and out and um uh and and luckily i'd been used to that i think years of doing stage work uh you know 
it, it, I do have a kind of a, I mean, it, it's probably on its way out the door and will only a hemorrhage even more in the next several decades as I age. But I've always been lucky that I'm, I'm pretty quick with memorizing, I think, because of years and years of doing plays like and doing theater. Muscle, um, yeah. But around the time, I remember when you get something that you need to learn fast, like, you know, plays, you have weeks to learn it. An audition, you might have four or five days to learn seven or eight pages of, you know, Aaron Sorkin dialogue. Um, around that time, I started for auditions. I started recording uh, this isn't like, you know, some groundbreaking thing. I know a lot of people who do this, but um, I started recording the whole scene, you know, like I would just read through the whole scene um, and put it on a voice memo. Um, I think because I play music and write music and and sing music, like listening is a really is a really good shortcut for memorization. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas some people, I think, more need to like look at the text Um Uh, I learned around that time that if I listened to the scene over and over again, while I'm doing dishes, walking down the street, going to get a coffee on the subway, if it's always kind of just in the back of my head for a couple of days, then when I go back to the script or the text, it'll be so much easier to memorize, especially because, you know, you're often having to do this stuff alone, which is one of the hardest parts. Mm -hmm. Um, it's hard to find somebody to run lines with sometime that, you know, that everyone has their own life. It's hard to find somebody to make your tape with you. And when you're doing a play, you know, you're lucky that you get to sit around a table with your castmates for weeks and weeks to learn it. But when you have to learn something on your own, it can be daunting and scary and frustrating. And uh, I found that the recording, you know, technique, which I still have been using to this day, um, is is a really nice way to just kind of drill it in into your brain so then you really have it in there and then you don't think about it as much which is an unbelievable process especially if you have the ear right right so so here's my question i have this coach that i work with i love her dearly dearly and i think a lot of um newer actors might get stuck in this trap. And I think this is a great question for you. Somebody that's in theater has to put up eight shows a week. Even if we go to the newsroom audition, you're going back several times, right? Having to do Mm -hmm. this audition again, same material. How do you seek not to repeat and keep it fresh? What do you have any strategy for that? Um, You know, for me, I love just choosing different jumping off points or different prior moments. So I'm not making sure I hit the transition just like this, you know, like having right. this discovery and some freedom with that. Like you have to be so, you're so skilled in that. You've done it for a decade. So do you have something that helps you even on set when you're like, okay, you're on your 10th take. How yeah. do you rediscover? How do you make it fresh again? I think for me, one thing I feel like I, and it's always, it's the, the funny thing is if it's ever evolving and ever changing um, for everyone, uh, and you know, I didn't because I started so young. I didn't, I didn't seek out any formal training. I didn't go to school for it. Uh, all the directors I worked with as a teenager kind of actually steered me away from it. They told me not. They said, "Keep working. Don't go to school for this." Um, and I'm, I'm, I, I don't have any regrets about the path that I took. But every now and then, I do wonder, like, oh, I wonder if I had more technique would you know what would what would that feel like now um but it's funny because I just did um I I used to do you know there was like a seven or eight year stretch there where it was mostly just theater I did like you know kind of three productions back to back I I remember I did my Broadway debut was in David Lindsay Bear's play Rabbit Hole Mm -hmm. and that closed on a Sunday and then on Monday I started rehearsals for the off-Broadway run of Spring Awakening which took me into the fall and then we moved to Broadway and I did that for a year. So I really was just, and I'm, I was young enough not to get too exhausted from it. Now I think I'd be in a hospital if I tried to do three <laughs> plays back to back. That's <laughs> impressive. But, Wait, you yeah. know, in my early twenties, there was no place else I'd rather be. But, you know, as I started doing more film and television and, um, and, uh, and, and then aging. And so, you know, and, and, the, and the industry is changing around me as well. Uh, I, I went, I, I, I did like five years in between plays. Like I hadn't been on stage for about five years. And then I, and then there was like a six year drought where I wasn't on stage. Um, and just last year, I did my first musical in a decade and my first, you know, piece of theater in six years. And 
Um, it's, um, it's this show called Swept Away. Um, it's my third collaboration with Michael Mayer, who did Spring Awakening in American Indian. John Logan, the legendary playwright and screenwriter, um, Oscar-winning screenwriter of Gladiator for, for one, and you know, has written three scripts for Martin Scorsese. He's a legend and a genius. Um, he wrote the book to it. And so it's much like Sorkin. It's just like, it's such a meal. It's a, such a gift for an actor because the language is so, um, so, so exciting and robust, but there's a ton of it. And um, I'm narrating the show. And so I'm a narrator. Uh, so I, I do direct address monologue to the audience. And then I go into book scenes with actors and then I sing songs as well. So it really was calling on everything I had um, to do it. And, 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 I, and the show is going to have life beyond. I think we did it at the Berkeley Rep Theater last year and it went so well that it's, it's going to keep going, I think, in the, in the coming years. Um, this is a long-winded answer, but what I'm trying to say is that um, th there was so much dialogue in it and, and we were doing the eight show schedule um, and, and the, eight, the eight show schedule of theater is, is, can be punishing because your weekend is you do a Friday night show and then you do a two o'clock matinee on Saturday and an eight o'clock show on Saturday and then a two o'clock matinee on Sunday and an eight o'clock show on Sunday. Um, and so you really, for, for about a two and a half day stretch, your life is the piece. You know, there's barely time or room for anything else but the piece that you have to perform. And doing long runs of plays, that's when I find the danger kicks in for the repetition, for checking out, uh, for it becoming like your grocery list you know, where you're, totally. you're, you're just kind of doing it on autopilot, which is the danger zone because you want to be comfortable, but you don't want to be that comfortable that you're checking out, you know? And so the thing that I feel like I do sometimes to, to make sure that I'm um, staying present is, you know, you might have a show on a Friday that's like, goes great. And you just feel like, oh my God, I'm, I was really in it. I loved the, I loved those transitions. I loved that scene that one line got like a big laugh and that's never happened. And I think the impulse is, well, let me try to do that exact thing again on Saturday afternoon because it really worked last night. And what I was trying to do on Swept Away was, uh, and again, thanks to aging, it becomes easier to forget things, but I try to forget it. I try to forget what I did the night before uh, because if, you know, if you're chasing down, let me do what worked last night then you know we all know that you're 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 not there you're, you're you're trying to make something happen again rather than just be open to it's a different day my my castmates are bringing are going to bring other stuff to the table um and let me bring other stuff to the table as well i mean that's the gift of theater is that you know if you just listen and and um and respond to what is happening around you so much of the work can kind of happen for you yeah. um because then you just have to be available and open to whatever is going to happen organically, you know, with your scene partner. So yeah, I say kind of throwing, throwing, if something worked, throw it away and, and, and try something else. That, yeah. that was, that's one of the best actors that I've worked with on stage. I see them doing that. And, and that's inspiring. That's it's invaluable really at the end of the day, because then it doesn't keep you trapped. And that's yeah. the thing that that's where I think creativity goes to die is once you're trapped in this place 100%. of trying to regenerate or like generate what you did before it's yeah. Or in, like you said, for multiple callbacks, yeah. people then get stuck in this. Well, what did I do before? Okay. I'm going to do, do I need to do that thing again? Or, Oh my God, it was totally different today. I have left, you know, tests before. And I was like, well, that was nothing like the other six auditions I did. Right. So I either bombed it right now or they're going to love that. That usually yeah. goes in the favor of loving, but as an, as somebody who's creating it, there is that like, oh God, I didn't do what they expected from the last time. So there's just this constant chase and you have to help redirect yourself or put the focus, like you said, on the people that you're playing with, put the focus outside of yourself, really. Again. Yeah. If you're not in that in that funnel I, there's there's two projects i have to ask about one sure. is, one is short term 12 because that's near and dear to my heart mm -hmm. i was um part of the sh uh the short i was in a class with brad hinky and tanya verafield everybody who made and uh, dustin came to class and then to see you guys do the feature i was so curious if that was an offer an audition process um 
because the material is just so rich and so beautiful and watching it come from a small a micro into this macro beautiful thing that is literally touched well that's when you came on the on the scene for me where I was like who is mm. this guy he's and I love that Dustin even kind of described you as like the older brother that all of us wish we had <laughs> oh, such a beautiful, so like, sweet Dustin is amazing. So I didn't know if you had that same response. Did you see the short before doing the feature? Yeah, that was one, uh, you know, I said a, a few minutes ago that like, um, you know, there's really only like 10 scripts that that I really am like, I can tell you where I was when I read it. And, uh, and short term 12 is one of those few. It was just one of the greatest scripts to this day that I've ever read. Um, it just knocked me cold i remember uh i was i had just finished season one of the newsroom it had just started airing and i i was back home in new york and i woke up one day and i was still in bed and i checked my email and my agent had sent me the, the all the materials for for short term 12 and i started reading the script i got about maybe 15 20 pages in and uh and i was crying and, you know, I think in this, when you read a lot of scripts, um, th th some, they're not always the most emotional document. I, like, I always say this, like, you know, especially for, for, for film, you know, they tend to be, they have to be kind of clinical because they're like, a, they're a, first and foremost, they're like a blueprint to, you know, what the line producer is going to break down into visuals. And so it's okay that they're not always written from like a, an emotional kind of place. Um, but every now and then you read one where the emotion of it just like cuts through and that's Destin, you know, like he's yeah. such a hard on his sleeve type of person that it, it just was pouring off of the page. Like the heart and soul that, that he put into it was overwhelmingly palpable. And it was one of those where I stopped reading I try not to respond to like my agents until I finished it because you never know what's going to happen in the last 30 pages or, you know, but short term 12 was one where I, I stopped reading the script and I wrote back to my acting reps and I just said, I'm 30 pages into this and I'm crying like this thing is special. What, what next? Like I want to, I want to I, I wanna meet this guy because I also had a feeling the role was so great and, and Brie Larson was attached. And I just thought like, people will want to play this part. So I, I don't want to miss my, miss my chance. And um, they said, okay, great. We'll, we'll set up a, a, like a FaceTime or a Skype, you know, this was 2012. So there's no oh, zoom yeah. yet, but, uh, but uh, we scheduled a, like a FaceTime or a Skype for me and Destin. And I remember in the, I finished the script and I was, it was perfect. Um, and then I looked on the email and realized they'd sent me the short as well. And then I watched the short and it's exquisite. It's so good. You did a beautiful uh, job. And his talent as a, and then I was like, okay, not only is he a phenomenal screenwriter, but now I'm seeing like his nuts and bolts talent as a, like a filmmaker and what he did visually and with music. I was just like, oh my God, I'm, I was blown away. And then we met and it was one of those like, you know, love at first sight. Like we just had this great meeting with each other. And I think shortly after I met with him, I got, got offered the role. Great. So people write in all the time. And this is, this is what I was hoping that this was an offer is that when you get to this place, or if you are so lucky, we all will get to, everybody gets to this place in their career. If, if you stay in it long enough, that then you're having creative phone calls, let's say. So then how do you present yourself in these type of conversations where it's not like, here's what I'm going to do with the character. Let me show you. It's your, it's a speaking. So were mm -hmm. you just gushy with dust? I don't know how you couldn't be with Dustin, but like, I would love to know like bullet points of like, okay, I'm going to go have this director's meeting. How much do you put out on the line? Do you talk mostly character? Do you talk about baseball instead? Like, do you divert right. and get yeah. them to let them get you know, to know you? Yeah. It's, I feel like it's always a little bit different. I'm very much like a, because I, I want to work with like, I, I want to work with great writers and great directors. And I want to work with directors that, you know, have a real point of view. Um, and so I, I, and because, you know, in the theater world, you're looking, your, your director is like your coach. I mean, I've never been a sports, the reason I got, the reason I got into this profession is because <laughs> of my lackluster ability in sports, but 
you know, you really want someone that's going to feel a little bit like, you know, coach Taylor, like that Friday night lights moment. That's totally. Gonna, we're going to give you some guidance and, and send you out on the field to do your best. And so I always kind of try to, like, I don't try to come in too much with the process. I, I kind of try to throw it away for every project and see how the filmmaker wants to do it. Um, because everybody's different in the way that they like to tell the story. And so I always try to leave room for like, okay, how do we, how do the, how do, the, how do they want to make this one? And what can I do to kind of play by their rules and not just keep it like, well, I like to do it ABC. And so I'm just going to do my process and it won't be, I won't be moved or changed. I always try to leave some room for that. And yeah, with Destin, I feel like you know, I was lucky that he had been watching the new episodes of the newsroom because they were airing that summer. So I think I was fresh on his mind. And, you know, short term 12 begins with my character. It was like a two and a half page monologue of him telling this story that's in the cold open before the opening credits. And I think Destin, he was like, yeah, one thing we've been worried about is that the guy talks a lot. Like for a movie, he has a lot of kind of natural off the cuff dialogue. And we've, and the fact that, you know, you can get through all this Sorkin dialogue bodes well, you know. Totally. Um, but I mostly just remember kind of we were geeking out uh, with each other. Um, I, I did gush on the script. I told him, look, I, I said I wrote my agents after 30 pages and told them I wanted to meet you. And I remember like I was very unemployed that summer. So I was growing like a bunch of scruff. And I remember Destin looking through me at the computer and just going, cool beard. <laughs> 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 he's he's so sweet and a sweetest. man of little words who puts out a lot of words but they're, I know they're impactful words right we're like yeah he's very observational it's just yeah. a, thank you for sharing that because I think so yeah. many people do get to that place where like I want this so badly but I don't want to sound desperate and I don't want to push away the project right I want to invite a collaborative conversation um, that also shows my enthusiasm for wanting to participate, right? Yeah, no, totally. It's a, it's a weird fine line because sometimes I do want to just be like, hey, I, I, if there's something I really, really love, then I will just say like, hey, this is so special and I absolutely love it. And it, it's, uh, and I really, I really want to do it. But I, I always kind of, I always leave things like I've had a lot and I've had a lot where I thought we were vibing and it was going great only to get an email a day later, Hey, they offered it to someone else. And then it's like, Oh shit. Well, I, I thought we were grooving. Right. Um, so I always try to leave it. Uh, sometimes I find myself saying the same thing at the end of every meeting where I just say like, Hey, no matter what happens, thank you very much. I'm a, I'm a big fan, you know, thanks for sitting down and taking the time because I know there's probably a ton of other people that they have to talk to. And I try to stay realistic about that stuff. Yeah. No. Um, Okay. because it's hard because you you really never know like it it's kind of I don't know if, if it's if it's totally 50 50 for me but like I'll get lucky where every once in a while like something will come through that is just an offer um but I still have to you know I still have to scramble and make tapes and uh and and have you know sometimes I feel like it'll 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 be just a meeting and then oh the meeting went really well but now they want you to read or uh and I, you know, it keeps you on your, as frustrating as it can be sometimes it, you know, it keeps you on, keeps you on your toes and keeps that and then, muscle. And yeah. sometimes it'll, it'll just be like a filmmaker that I really want to meet, you know, and I'll try to just think like, well, no matter if I get the part or not, just be grateful that you get a chance to meet someone that you look yeah. up to and have that conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. At the end of the day. Okay. Modern love. Yeah. Damn, you were so good. Come oh, on. thanks. Especially after newsroom, when I, 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 I just was casually watching it one day, and I was like, "Damn, this is so great and so oh, different. Thanks. Such a departure from what we'd seen of you on television and film." I just, I loved it. Was that an offer? Or was that an audition? That was, uh, that was one of those fortunate offers. Um, yeah, I loved that they were able to just be like here because that I can't imagine that character in anybody else. Oh, thank you. That was really fun. That was kind of like doing like a, we shot it really quick. I think we 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 shot it in like four or five days because it was really just me and Sophia Butella in that episode. Um, there were other actors playing, you know, supporting roles, but it was kind of like you know, it reminded me a little bit of like the, you know, the before, the, the before movies, before sunrise, the Linklater movies with Ethan uh -huh. Hawke and Julie Delphi, which I love so much. 
where you really are just spending the whole time with these two people and it's and it was dialogue driven and um and it was funny and sad and sweet and that was a that was a total no brainer when I got asked to do that. I was like, oh yes, I'll be there. This is this is really special. So great technical question because mm-hmm. again, everybody gets to this point. I've been on sets before where people get the offer and they haven't had a conversation yet with the director. You can tell when they arrive to set. And it's like the director's vision. You've got this vision over here. And then this wonderful actor who's been offered a part. So they haven't auditioned their idea yet. Right. Um what is some insight on how to marry the two when it's day one of production and you are now as the actor who's been given the offer offering Mm -hmm. your take that may or may not be what the visionary was thinking so if you have any insight or how do you handle i love your face right now because you know you've been on where you're like well that's not going as anticipated and then it kind of crumbles the whole thing or you see it go really well I'm glad you're bringing this up. This is something that I think about a lot. And it's a, it's one of the reasons why like I'm, I'm envious to a degree of, of actors that are just like offer, 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 offer. Um, because yeah, doesn't that sound great to, to not have to, you know, try to, you know, reach for the, the brass ring anymore. Totally. Um, but at the same time, like, yeah, the danger I always feel is like, well, you don't know if I can do it. And I don't even really know if I can do it. Um, And that was one where it was really kind of intense because I was filming, uh, I was making a movie at the, the, it was an embarrassment of riches that fall 2018 because I was filming a movie in Toronto and we worked it out so that I could do, it looked for a minute that I I couldn't, I almost couldn't do modern love because of my schedule with this film. And um, with some amazing work by my reps and the line producer on both projects, we hammered out a schedule where I flew home from Toronto to New York on like the 6.30 a.m. flight, and I went straight to set. I got picked up at the airport. Mm-hmm. So you have didn't... to shake off a character to step yeah. into a totally different story and world. And I didn't sleep. I was so <laughs> anxious about my the cars coming at 4 a.m., uh, that I, I literally just, you know, I think eyes wide open in my hotel room in Toronto until I got picked up. And then I went straight to set and got into my wardrobe. And then the next thing I know, I'm on set with Sophia Butella and our director, Tom. And uh, I just remember thinking, I'm just going to throw the thing that is, I always just feel like I'm going to throw my first instinct. Like when I read it and the way it pops into my head and the way it comes out of my mouth, up front initially that's my gut instinct i'm going to go with that just because the, they that exists for a reason but if if i feel like it's not working and if i get noted like hey take it in this direction i'm i'm so happy to throw away my gut instinct and say okay what else you got oh you have another idea for it great let's try that i, I never ever really feel like and I think some actors have a process of like, I know how I'm going to do it. I know the way I'm doing it. It's right. You can't tell me that it's wrong. And here we go. And, you know, I have more power to you. Like that's rock and roll and badass in its own way. But for me, I'm like, I don't know that I have the best idea. And I never want to feel like, oh, I have the best idea. I think you miss out on the magic and the gift and the joy of collaboration by saying, hey, tell me what you think. I might have it wrong, you know? Um, well, that, I think that sometimes even helps with, you know, like we were talking about before, if seeking to repeat, it's actors that are really stuck in their ways that kind of seek to repeat. If you can hear some insight from anybody else while on in the same story, you know, that discovery process is going to be pretty organic if you can take that note and collaborate. It's just, I'm. thank you for answering that. I figured with you coming from a background of theater where you are in a collaborative process and everybody's trying to figure it out together, you landing with an offer is going to have you not be, you know, high strung with, okay, I'm going to yeah. present this idea. And, okay, cool. Well, now we're going to go in a different direction. Like, you know, it's, it, it seems very, you're malleable. I, I, tr- yeah, well, I mean, you certainly try. I mean, I, I'll, I'll tell you one thing. I, I, in the last couple of years, I had a thing happen where, uh, it was, there was a, a, a production b- being done at a show in New York, um, a theater piece. And I got 
I got asked to to zoom with the the writer and the director and uh I sat down on the zoom and it was going really well and every it, it seemed like uh, I don't know if they're going to offer it to me on this Zoom or if the offer is going to come in the next couple hours or the next couple of days, but it felt like it was nearing that part of the process. But I had a thing once where I got offered to do a play and I did it having not auditioned for it. And I, I kind of regretted it. I looked back on it and I thought, I kind of wish I'd gone in and auditioned because the director and I didn't really get off on on the right foot and I never really felt like he trusted my take on the character and I just thought well they shouldn't have offered it to me they, they should have made me audition and then maybe I wouldn't have gotten it and and we could spare ourselves this hardship you know and so when I was doing this this meeting that almost turned into a zoom now I don't know if this was the best idea but I just said hey I don't know what you guys are thinking but if you'd be open to it, I think I should come in and read. And I basically forced an audition on these guys. And they said, would you really do that? I said, yeah, I think I'd, I'd prefer it because I, I don't know what you're looking for and I don't know how I'm going to do it just yet. So why don't we just get in the room and I'll, I'll, I'll take a swing at it and, and we'll see how it goes. And both of them, the writer and the, they were like, this is amazing. We, we love this. And it's so nice of you. And we didn't, we thought maybe you'd be offended if we asked you to audition. And he said, no, not at all. I went in and auditioned and I didn't get it. And, <laughs> no way. <laughs> yes. And, you know, to After their credit, <laughs> my reps were like, you, what were you thinking? Like you were about to get the offer, you know? And well, I was like, but I felt something was up and I trusted my gut and I went in and it was like, right. I wasn't what they were looking. I wasn't right for it. Well, you saved the heartache then and in the project. Yeah. I just thought the right hands. Oh, because probably. there's nothing I've been in things where you get two weeks in and you realize they don't like what I'm doing and I, yeah. and we can't quite find a way to make it work together. And I just, I told, I just taught myself life's too short. And I, I was like, I want to avoid that moving forward. And so, yeah. especially with theater, cause it is, I think a little more intense, a little harder, and then you have to live with it. And then you have to get up eight times a week and do it. That just, I almost like would prefer to audition sometimes. Well, that's what's so great. I taught, uh, Chikuti Awuji did an interview a few weeks back and he really emphasized pending your interest. And sometimes your interest in what you want to do and what the visionary of the projects wants to do, those interests might not line up. So mm -hmm. why get into this combative place where both energies are not in alignment versus, you know, being in a flow where everybody's able to bring it. I actually really highly respect that process because you're right, you're stuck with this for however long. And it's not even just your, I shouldn't say stuck, but it's your responsibility for however long. And if it's mm -hmm. television and if it's film, then it's out there for a lifetime. And you can't walk around with a little billboard. That's like, well, I wasn't really interested. I was interested in doing it this way, but they did it this way. It, it, there's no, you have to really, uh, look at the bigger picture. Sometimes I think as an artist or as an actor, Oh, absolutely. You want the job. So you just want to be working that validation of working so badly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You grab at things, or once you do get to a place of offers, really, you're like, well, I don't know how long this is going to last. I'm taking everything, taking it all. I'm just right, take exactly. Take this that inspiration, that interest, falls a little short if we're not really absolutely looking for it. No, that's so right. And and I'm just naturally, um, you know, I'm I have a lot of doubt. You know, I have a lot of self doubt as part of my process. I think I've come to embrace it. I used to think it was a fault. Now I think it's just human. And, and so I kind of, I need a little bit of a cheerleader, like, I, I, like the, the kind of tough love. Oh, I don't, I don't know if this director likes me or not. It's like, no, it's, if you, if you like me and you want me to do the gig, show me that and believe that I can get it done. And if you don't, then there's someone else that, that you're going to want, you know, in, in the trenches with you, because it's, it can be messy, weird, confusing, work this thing that we do and i, I just kind of only want to go where where people are really psyched to have me 
because yeah. it, it the, the the opposite is such a such a Ooh, bad feeling it's such know? a bad feeling i also i mean i like you said this is a human condition of self doubt and stuff but our characters are such an extension of ourselves like your characters having that dial tone sometimes turned up of the self doubt is what makes every single character you play i, I it's hard to not lean in and cheerlead for them because mm. we see ourselves in it so just wanted to say that do you oh, want to do some nice. rapid fire before we end yeah we hell yeah questions okay rapid fire so you just have to answer oh, right away okay great favorite first job favorite first job um Oh, I probably, I mean, I, I just go back to um, the play that I did, the, the first David Lindsay Bear play I did, uh, Kimberly Akimbo, which is now a, like a, a musical that's doing really well on Broadway right now. But it started as a, as a play that I worked on for about two years in my late teens. And, you know, it was the play that I moved to New York for, and it was a totally life-changing experience. And it's a beautiful piece of writing and I love it. And it's so great to see it all the way through like that, like to see it still have legs, right? It's still I going know, it's, and it's like, and... oh my God, it's like a totally successful Broadway musical right now. If you'd told me when I was 18 that, that, you know, in 20 years, it would be on Broadway as a, as a musical, I wouldn't have believed it, but it's life is so strange that way. Life is so sh- okay. Favorite audition prep song, especially you as a musician. Oh, favorite audition prep song. Oh, I feel like. There was a period where I was, so I, yeah, when I, I was doing a play once, um, I was doing, uh, I was doing a play that, uh, at the Atlantic Theater Company in 2008 called Farragut North, got turned into a film called The Ides of March with Ryan Gosling. And, uh, and I remember my, 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 the playwright, Bo Williman, who's still a really dear friend, made me a playlist of like for the character. He was like, this is for the character. Like, these are these are like your swagger songs. They were trying to get me to have more swagger in this role. And I remember like the I don't know where to find it because it was like an underground thing, but it was the the Danger Mouse. It was like the remix of Jay-Z's 99 Problems mixed with uh, uh, Helter Skelter by the Beatles. And it was like this hybrid, like really crazy, gnarly mashup of those two songs. And that was kind of like my hype song for a couple of years after a, that. I could not, I can't even <laughs> think of the blend of that. That's amazing. It was rad. Okay. Do you have an audition superstitious tradition that you do? Oh, um, no, more of like a, you know, more of like, I try to find like a, a thing to treat myself with afterwards like the recovery guy yeah Yeah. to to be like okay you did it you did it dude now go do some like I feel like earlier it would be like I'll go earlier in my in my 20s it was like go have a beer or something or now it's more of like oh I'll like look at I'll like look at the map sometimes before an audition and be like oh there's a really great smoothie place around the corner that's what I'm gonna look forward to uh you know rewards go give yourself a little self-care afterwards go get that smoothie you for getting through that audition Favorite character you've played? Oh my gosh. Um, right now I feel like it, it uh, maybe it's just because it's the last one I played, but the, this, this, this character that I just played in this John Logan, Michael Mayer, Avid Brothers musical swept away, this tragic, um, uh, disturbed uh, whaler in the late 1800s uh, who finds himself in a you know, kind of life or death situation on a shipwreck. Uh, it was just like one of the greatest roles um, I, I've, I've ever been entrusted with. Oh, delicious. Okay. Most heartache job loss or lost. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. There was a play. I don't want to like implicate anybody, but there yep. was, there was a play that I did. I'd like developed. I did a lot of like developmental readings of it and, uh, from like from like 1920, like a couple of years in my in my late teens, early 20s, um, and I I, uh, I uh, the opportunity came. It, it made its way finally to a theater off Broadway in New York City. And despite the fact that I'd done a lot of readings for it, they got a new director, and I had to go in and re audition. Um, and even though I had I felt a real ownership over the role and I was really tight with the playwright and, and I, I really thought it was going to go my way because I'd done all the readings. I didn't get it. 
Um, and that was a, that was, you know, and I was young, I always think I was 20 or something. And that was like, uh, that was like, didn't get out of bed for a couple of days level of, uh, of, of dejection. But, you know, it made me realize like, wow, this, this can and will happen. And I'm going to have to get, you know, a, a little thicker skin because I didn't, I didn't want to be decimated or leveled like that ever again. I mean, it's so hard not to be decimated. And I'm glad that like, sometimes you just need that recovery process. I mean, I've heard stories of people where they put out breakdowns and they're like, you know, like Alicia Oxy type, and then they won't see Alicia Oxy. I mean, I've heard some, gr- it's so bizarre to me, but again, you, you know, you put your stamp on it and then like, no, no, thank you. We're going to go. No, with thanks. This. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's enough to make you, you know, it, it's enough to make you crazy. It really, it truly is. is. I mean, it's a, it's a bananas business. <laughs> it is. Okay. Favorite actor you worked with? Oh, well, the one that just came to mind, um, uh, the, the two of them just popped into my mind at the same time. And it's Michael Shannon and Fran McDormand. Oh, um, just because, you, that, I mean, any better. Lord. No, enough said. Come Mike on. played my brother. We did Long Day's Journey into Night on Broadway together. And Fran played my mom, which I still I can't get over. Um, Such a great pro- Was she part of that audition process when you got that role? She wasn't. I, those were, I, the, I, w- I went in and read for two different parts with the director and the producer and the casting director. And she was very involved, Fran, because she was also executive producing. And, uh, and so I know that she watched all of my tapes, but she was, if she had been in the room, I don't think I would have gotten it because I, I would have been too thrown. I would have been too, too starstruck. She's everything. She's every. she truly, I mean, you know, the best of the best. Literally Meryl Streep. What? I'm sorry. I think Fran is like, <laughs> I'm not arguing with Meryl, but I'm just saying there are others that need yeah. that same light that just, whew. okay. Last one. Favorite Tom Hanks film. Oh, I just went straight to, I mean, I know he's not in it all that much. So this feels, it's, it's probably like a, a tie between that thing you do and the burbs. Yes. <laughs> oh my God. I love it. This was so rad. Thanks for walking oh, through your journey pleasure. and your process. You are such a joy to watch. I cannot wait to see you on stage, Thank but you. just getting to see you work in television and film it really you really do create characters and live in a story that as an audience member and as an actor I'm just always cheering and so grateful to see your instrument at work it's it's really so thank you for doing this thank you for coming that means so much to me thank you kindly yeah this was a real treat thanks so much for asking me to do it yeah, of course. Okay, where can everybody follow along on in the Instagram? And then you've got a you've got a yeah. film coming out with Luce with Lucy Hale, which brings me to you. Yes, yeah, we just did this movie together um, uh, in the fall. Um, I don't know what the plans are for that one. I think they're still editing it in post right now. But I love Lucy. We 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 had a, we, I was only I only work a couple of days on it because it's a the whole movie's a series of flashbacks. But um, she was a dream. So nice. So great to work with. She's a great one to work with. And yeah, I'm on, I'm on the, I'm on there. I'm on Instagram and Twitter. I think John Gallagher Jr. is my handle on both of them. And, and uh, yeah, I'm always, I'm mostly either like, um, you know, talking about horror movies or trying to get people to come see my gigs as a musician. That's usually I know, what I'm I was just going to say, that was the next thing is like, when are you gigging next? What's next? I've actually, yeah, I've got some shows coming up in the, the, the end of this month. I'm doing five nights at Lincoln Center Theater, um, uh, May 17th to the 21st in New York. So those should be fun. That's uh, pretty rad. That's yeah, really I'm fun. excited. So they yeah. can go to your Instagram to get tickets or obviously the yes. Lincoln Center to get tickets as well. Oh, so. yeah, yeah. I'm all, I'll be posting this up a storm between now and the shows. So I'll, I'll, I'll get a lot of followers who will then unfollow me because I never shut up. No! <laughs> Thank you. Of course.